Welcome back everyone. And if this is your first time here, let me explain that I make videos about whatever I find interesting at the time. Sometimes that might be science, history, linguistics, or in this case, science fiction, and I call this series Sci-Fi Junkie. And today we're gonna talk about Brill, the power of the coming race. And this is old-timey science fiction. It was published in 1871. And it's always interesting to read old-timey science fiction. It's always insightful. First, let's talk about the author, Baron Edward Bulwer Lytton. Because have you ever heard the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword? Or the pursuit of the almighty dollar? Or it was a dark and stormy night? Because this guy came up with all of those phrases, which is crazy because today he's a pretty much unknown author. But back in the day, he wasn't just a recognized author, he was very successful. And many of his books and plays were adapted into operas, many of his books were bestsellers. And this guy, he just had a very interesting life. Uh, he got into politics and he became very important in the colonial empire of Great Britain at the time. He was one of the founders of British Columbia in Canada. Um, he, well, he was also a very famous and successful writer. Uh, at one point, he was offered the crown of Greece for some reason. For real, he was offered to become the king of Greece. And then he put his ex-wife in an insane asylum when she wrote a book about their relationship which is crazy, but don't worry, don't worry. She came out a week later and she kept criticizing him for, his whole, for her whole life. And he was also a lot into occult stuff and esoteric stuff. You know, like abstract projections, uh, talking with ghosts, sciences, uh, the e purifying energies of crystals and all that stuff your mom talks about in her Essential Oils Facebook group. And so he put many of those ideas in his books. And when you write books for crazy people, you are gonna get crazy reactions. Because it turns out that many people that were in secret societies and stuff, they thought that he was part of their secret societies. And they would write him letters and invite him to meetings and stuff like that. And he would reject them, or at least he said he would. And there were even clubs formed around his books in England and, and Germany. But they weren't just fan clubs. These were people that thought that the stories in his books were real. Or if not real, that they had some real elements or that he was using his books to communicate secret esoteric knowledge. And even the Nazis got into all that stuff. I mean, he was long dead by then. He died in the 1800s. But, but still, <laughs> you can see the kind of people that were reading his books. So when I learned about Brill, the power of the coming race, I, I just had to read. I just had to know like <laughs> what kind of crazy stuff is in this book. And so let's begin. Uh, the book is told in first person by an unnamed narrator. This narrator tells us that he is from the United States, that his family is rich, and that his father ran for Congress, but he was defeated by his tailor. Uh, he says that as his, like some kind of tragedy, uh, that, that in, he, uh, a rich man was defeated by just a common hard working class man. And this is like a foreshadowing of how the book, of what the book is going to be about. Anyway, uh, he says that uh, he has a friend that works or worked uh, at a mine and he invites him to check it out. So they get some helmets, they go to the mine, they start exploring, seeing the caves and whatever, and then they fall through a shaft and his friend dies, but the narrator survives. And he sees just a bunch of lamps and a road and they don't look like the lamps that the miners use. They look like street lamps or something like that. And he walks through this road and eventually he sees a huge valley and there's a city there, and not just a city, but there are plantations and there are of, of, uh, plants and animals. And there's even like, like airplanes going above him. He's, he calls them flying ships. There, there were no airplanes back then, I think. 
and everything is illuminated by just tens of thousands of lamps all around and and that actually it's pretty cool up to that point i was i was enjoying that book the the, the vision of this underground civilization is really interesting and also if you are also into a lot of science fiction and you have read a lot of old-timey science fiction you will know that the idea of secret underground civilizations is a very common trope in science fiction and I don't know if, if Edward Bulwer came up with it but I think he at least popularized it um, because I, I think this was the first book that promoted that with this idea that became very famous but anyway uh, eventually he becomes the guest of the richest man in this city and his daughter starts teaching him the language and at this point like the book has no plot it's just the narrator explaining to us the language of these people their culture their religion their philosophy their history their government everything what we call war building and in paper I should love this book because I love war building and even more I like I love war building just for the sake of war building I think you don't have to tell a story in order to show me a beautiful world and that's that's why Ursula Le Guin is one of my favorite writers because she does a lot of war building and she has books that are just about war building without having really a plot but the problem is that this is not war building for war building's sake. This is actually an utopian book. Now, this is like when Plato wrote Atlantis or when Thomas Moore wrote, well, Utopia. This is just like, it's more like an essay where the war building is used to present us the ideas of the author about how a perfect society should be. And there's also the opposite, like books like 1984 or Brave New World that show us dystopias, uh, which are just like the opposite of a dystopia, horrible world. And when you read those books, you have to keep in mind that not all of us are going to agree on how a utopia should be. We all have different values and different ideas. The problem is that the author is a racist, misogynist, proto-fascist, piece of shit and his version of, of a utopia is pretty stupid. To prove this, let me just give you an overview of the world building in this book. And let's start with like the creation myth of the, of the Brill Jet. So a long time ago, there were people living on the surface of the earth and then, and they had pretty advanced technology. And then there was this huge flood that the narrator says that might be the flood from the Bible and that the people in the surface survived or they lost all their technology so they had to start from scratch but that some people managed to escape underground with most of their technology and their knowledge and once they were underground they managed to prosper until they forgot that the surface existed it became just a myth and then they continuing they continued developing into kingdoms and republics very similar to our own for thousands of years until at some point they discovered Brill. Now this is one of the best things in the book because when it was published Michael Faraday who is one of my favorite scientists had just proven that light, electricity and magnetism are all the same thing. They are just different manifestation of the electromagnetic field. And I think that very recently Maxwell had published the, Max the Maxwell equations that, pull of the, that put all of these into math. And then Faraday had proposed that if all of these things, light, electricity and magnetism, were just the same thing, well then maybe everything in the universe was just different manifestations of just one fundamental principle. And this idea in physics is called unification. And it is still very popular. It was the driving idea behind the development of the standard model of particle physics, a, a theory that has just given some amazing predictions, like the existence of the Higgs boson. 
So the fact that the author was back then like perceiving the importance of this new idea in physics, uh, it's really cool. That, that's one of the reasons I like all timey science fiction. So that's one point for the author there. So these people discovered this one unifying force that Faraday was talking about, and they call it Brill. And they can control it with their Brill staffs. And Brill staffs are just like weapons. They can be used to destroy like huge rocks to make roads, but they also can be used to kill dinosaurs because apparently there are dinosaurs in this world. They didn't go extinct. They went underground apparently. Uh, but they, but these Brill stuffs can be also used to cure people. Like if you're wounded, they can cure you with Brill. And it can even control your mind. Uh, at several points in the book, people use Brill to make the main character fall asleep and stuff like that. And so, yeah, basically we, you can do everything with Brill, which sounds more like magic than science. But then you remember that phrase from Arthur C. Clarke that any and sufficiently advanced advanced technology looks like magic, so yeah, but, uh, uh, it's fine. Sadly, this is where the book stops being fine and becomes very, very stupid. Because he describes that these people that call themselves the Brilja live in many huge empires, but that when they discover the Brill and everyone had access to these Brill stats that, remember, can be used like very powerful weapons, well, at that point, anyone could kill anyone else extremely easy. This meant that the governments could no longer use force to rule their citizens, and they were forced to rule by consensus. So basically, and this is what sets these people to become a utopia. So basically he's saying that what society needs is for everyone to have guns. A message that I think would be just at home in Fox News today. Uh, but let's continue. Uh, so after these huge empires were forced to rule by consensus, they dissolved into this confederacy of city-states, and each city-state is ruled by a magistrate. Now, you would think that since the author just said that they cannot rule with force but by consensus, that this magistrate would be chosen democratically. But no, there is this college of scholars and they choose the magistrate for life. And the magistrate is basically an absolute monarch. And that's not, that's not my interpretation. Those are the words from the author in the book that he himself says that the title of magistrate is just to obscure that this is actually an absolute monarch. <laughs> and that's what the author says. Evidently, I am loved by a princess, the first maiden of this land, the daughter of the absolute monarch whose autocracy they so idly seek to disguise by the republican ch title of chief magistrate. Uh, anyway, so you, you see this contradiction of the author saying that in real society, government is rules by consensus but is not chosen by the people and the ruler has absolute power. So it's like he wants to have his cake and eat it too. And we are going to see this a lot in the book. We are just beginning. Because then he goes on to explain that because the people in this society have very high moral standards, uh, it's really easy to rule them. There is no need for police and st or stuff like that, which is already very problematic. But then he says that ruling is so easy that government is not intrusive and you barely notice it and the people that have the responsibility to rule is just like a side job that doesn't take too much time. So you would think that this guy is a libertarian because that's what libertarians want, right? Like a government that intrudes in the lives of people as little as possible. But then he explains that in real society, everyone is equal. And not just that, that even if there's a person that has a lot more wealth than another person, the government ensures that everyone has the same standards of living. 
so there is really no poor people, uh, regardless of how wealthy you might be. <laughs> and we are supposed to believe that this very small government that doesn't intrude in the lives of people ensures that everyone has the same standard of living. And he also says that this very small government that almost doesn't do anything charges a lot of taxes and does a lot of stuff. So it's like he contradicts himself all the time. Then he explains that in this society everyone is equal. There is no working class and there is no aristocracy. But he rushes to explain that no, this is not communism for some reason, just it's not communism, take his word for it. And then, if there is no working class, who does all the jobs that I ask? Well, robots. Which is, okay, that, that's a good science fiction answer. But it turns out that there are many jobs that robots cannot do. So then, who does all the jobs that robots cannot do? Well, children. Yeah, I'm not even making this up. That, that's what the author says, that there are children working as chauffeurs, as butlers, working in stores, working in farms, and that once you become an adult, you can either have a farm or have a store, or you don't even need to work, really. It's just your choice. <laughs> and, and it gets even worse, because it turns out that in this underground world the, there are many dangerous animals, like dinosaurs, right? And that they need people patrolling the limits of the valley to make sure that these dangerous animals don't harm anyone. And that job is also done by children, specifically four-year-olds. I'm not making this up. The author specifically says that children that are four years old are given real stuffs, which remember are basically like these mass destruction weapons in your hand, and they are sent to kill dinosaurs. The second service of danger, less grave, is the destruction of all creatures hostile to the life or the culture or even the comfort of the Arna. Of these, the most formidable are the vast reptiles, of some of which antediluvian relics are preserved in our museums, and certain gigantic wing winged creatures, half bird, half reptile. These, together with lesser wild animals, corresponding to our tigers or venomous serpents, it is left to the younger children to hunt and destroy, because, according to the Arna, here ruthlessness is wanted, and the younger a child, the more ruthlessly he will destroy. Apart from this danger, you might chance to encounter some child of four years old just put in possession of his brill staff, and who, in alarm at your strange appearance and, the, and in the impulse of the moment, might reduce you to cinder. Oh, this is another very stupid thing in the book. He's not just stupid in, in, in an economical or political sense, also ecologically. He says, Oh, how wise is nature that all the animals that people don't like eventually go extinct? Isn't that amazing? It seems a law of nature that animals not useful to man gradually recede from the domains he occupies or even become extinct. And he explains that these children go around killing all the animals that they don't like and if they find an animal and they try to tame it, uh, but if they cannot tame it, then they kill it, because that, that's how it should be. Humans should kill anything they don't like in nature. <laughs> and then you have religion, because it turns out that these people believe that there is a creator and they believe in an afterlife, but they never try to say anything about that god or that afterlife. They think that it is pointless. So it sounds like they are agnostics, right? But then he explains how they have, for example, a word for God that is so sacred that he never hears it. He just knows that they have it. And they have rituals that they never let him take part of because he is not part of the group. And so, like, are they religious or not, dude? He wants to have his cake and eat it too. Um, but I've let the worst for the end. And these are his ideas about gender equality. 
It begins very promisingly. He says that in real society, men and women are perfectly equal. They can do any job they want, they can do whatever they want with their lives, and they are perfectly equal in front of the law, everything. And that sounds really good, especially when you consider when you consider that this book was written in 1871, but when in many countries uh, women were not allowed to vote, to vote. But then, and this is where everything gets really stupid, uh, he says that even though women can have works in government, they almost always choose not to. Uh, remember that they have jetpacks that they can, that they can use to fly? Well, when they get married, they choose never to use them again. And when they get married, most of them choose not to work. In fact, he goes over and over about how women should sacrifice themselves for their husbands, how they shouldn't be better than their husbands are, are anything, and if they are, they should hide it. That precisely because we are the stronger sex, we rule the other, provided we never show our strength. If you were superior to my son in making timepieces and automata, you should, as his wife, always let him suppose you thought him superior in that art to yourself. The an, uh, here, uh, arn means man and gi means woman. Also, he says that it's pronounced arn, even though he writes an, whatever. The arn tacitly allows the preeminence of the gi in all except his own special pursuits, but if she either excels him in that or affects not to admire him for his proficiency in it, he will not love her very long. <laughs> Perhaps he may even divorce her. <laughs> but where a guy, guy, but where a gi really loves, she soon learns to love all that the Ann does. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> It gets, and it gets even worse, like for real, I can, I could just read this book aloud and it would be like a stand-up routine for all the stupid things he says about gender. And so basically, he wants women to be equal to men in, in the law, but then he wants them to choose to live exactly as they already lived in his society of England in 1871. <sighs> he wants to have his cake and eat it too. And I guess that at this point we have to come back to the plot because there's a little bit of plot near the end of the book. Remember the woman that teaches the narrator the language of the Brilja people? Well, her name is C and she's a scientist uh, because she has not married, so, so, so she's still working, of course. And the narrator says how she's very smart and she, she's very kind. She's just all around amazing. And also important is that in the real society, the women are usually the ones that pursue men and not the other way around. They are the ones that propose marriage and that stuff. So that's fine. And that C falls in love with the narrator. But there's a problem. The narrator says that he doesn't love her back. Which is, okay, whatever. But instead of going with her and talking with her, uh, about like, hey, I know uh, you have feelings for me, but I don't. He goes with her father for some reason. And when he tells his father, like, hey, I think your, your daughter is onto me. He says, if you marry her, I'm going to kill you. And that's not like subtext, that's not implied. He literally says that he's going to use his brill stuff and, con and turn him into a cinder of ashes. That's literally what it says in the book. I grieve for you, because such a marriage would be against the aglauran, or good of the community. For the children of such a marriage would adulterate the race. <laughs> They may even come into the world with the teeth of carnivorous animals. This could not be allowed. C, as a gi, cannot be controlled. But you, as a tish, can be destroyed. I advise you then to resist her addresses, to tell her plainly that you can never return her love. This happens constantly. Many Arn, however ardently wooed by, wo by one gi, rejects her and puts an end to her persecution by wedding another. The same course is open to you. 
No, for I cannot wed another gi without equally injuring the community and exposing it to the chance of rearing carnivorous children. That is true. All I can say is, all I can say, and I say it with the tenderness due to a dish and the respect due to a guest, is frankly this. If you yield, you will become a cinder. And it's just like... Crazy. And, and, and then they also explained that if they had children, they would be an abomination because they would be mixed raced. They say something about the teeth because he used to eat meat and they are vegetarians in that society. And, and the, so the brilliant happened, turned out to be some very racist people. And they are not just racist towards the narrator because he comes from the surface. No, no, no. They are racist towards other underground people as well, because turns out that there are many people in this underground world that have not discovered the Brill. And so they are inferior to the Brill, yeah. And they even mentioned that one time these people tried to wage war against them, and then they just sent a group of teenagers armed with Brill stuff to kill 60 million of them. And they are like, of course we kill people that are inferior to us. And at some point there is this phrase that says that it's not a crime to kill people who are bad for society. That, that's literally what it says in the book. And, and, and not just that, the author at some point says that the Vrilja treat other people from other civilizations like he treats black people. That's literally what it says in the book. It's not even my interpretation, okay? Nations which, not conforming their manners and institutions to those of the Brilja, nor indeed held capable of acquiring the powers of the, over the Brill agencies which it hath taken them generations to attain and transmit, were regarded with more disdain than citizens of New York regard black people. So, <laughs> you would think that when you have this character saying like, hey, these people are being racist to me the same way I am racist against black people. They are threatening to kill me because this woman found me attractive. They are saying that mixed race children are an abomination. Uh, they are saying that it's okay to kill all the people that are inferior to you. And you, you think that at that, that, that point he would be like, hey, Maybe my racist ideas are wrong. Maybe now that I'm the victim of racism, I can see why racism is cruel and bad. But no, that's not what happens. Instead, he's like, of course, of course he would kill me if I marry his daughter. We are of different races. Of course, of course our children would be abominations. I would not dare have children with someone from another race. Of course, of course they kill people that are inferior to them. In fact, if they ever go to the surface, they are probably going to kill all of us. And that, and he's like, of course they would, that, that's normal. That's what you do when you are superior to other people. It's, it's just so sad. It's just so monumentally sad how someone can have all of these racist ideas so internalized that not even when they are hurting him, he can bring himself to challenge those ideas. <sighs> And you would think that C, the woman that is in love with the narrator, would challenge those racist ideas, because after all, she's in love with him. But no, she says, well, we cannot get married, because of course it would be an abomination if you and I had sex, we are a different racist. But we can get married in the soul. <laughs> and she never explains what it means, but it sounds very lame, whatever. Um, and so, eventually, uh, this boy can, uh, comes for the protagonist and invites him to walk around. Actually, this is the boy that found him at first, so they became friends. And as they are walking around, the narrate, it dawns on the narrator that he says, you're gonna kill me, right? They send you to execute me. And the child is like, oh yeah, they, they send me to execute you. Uh, but if that makes you sad, the child says, I'm gonna kill myself as well. <laughs> this book is 50 shades of fucked up. 
And again, it's not like the narrator says like, oh, that, that would be very bad. He's like, oh, that's admirable that your people are so sure about the afterlife that you don't fear death. That's so cool. That's so cool of you. Anyway, but he says like, no, no, don't kill yourself and don't kill me. Like, can you at least try to convince your father? Ah, because his father is the magistrate that gave the order to execute him. Uh, he says like, can you try to convince your father not to kill me? And he's like, well, maybe. And then, uh, well, there is no day-night cycle because they are underground, but they do uh, have the sleeping time and waking time. And then uh, he is woken up by C, that, uh, and she tells him like, nope, uh, this, this boy wa didn't, was not able to convince his father not to execute you, they are going to execute you tomorrow, you have to escape now. And so she takes her jetpack and they find the shaft through which he fell and she takes him back to the mine and then she uses her Brill staff to cause an avalanche so that no one from her world will be able to go back and he's no, I, he's, he will not be able to go back to, to their city. And then he goes back to the normal world and he writes the book. And so yeah, that's, that's Brill, the power of the coming race. And it's very interesting that I think I know why Edward Bulwer Lytton became a very unknown author uh, after the 1940s. I think his ideas back then were very popular because he was very racist, he loves authority, he loves tradition. Uh, but then the world realized that those ideas are very cruel and very evil and bad in general. And so I think that that's why he became uh, so unknown. But then again, it's not like we are, uh, it's not like we are still fighting against racist uh, and fascist ideas today. I mean, I think that if you said my, most of the ideas in this book, in many conservative circles in the internet, people would agree with most of them or pretty much, or maybe all of it. Maybe many people read this book and think like, oh yeah, this would be a utopia. And, and that's sad. It's sad that after all this time, we are still fighting against these ideas. But my takeaway from this book is that those ideas of racism, fascism and misogyny are so bad that they end up hurting even the people who are in favor of them. After all, the main character ends the book running away from this utopian society because they are going to kill him. And even though he agrees with them at first, in the last pages of the book, he says that I wish I could have stayed with C. Uh, maybe I did love her, but I did not have the courage to challenge the racist ideas of her society. And so maybe that's the reason those ideas will always fail, because since they are cruel and evil, they end up hurting everyone, even the people who are in favor of them. And so eventually even those people turn against those ideas. Of course, by the time the narrator starts thinking that these ideas are not good, he already left the love of his life behind. So it is too late for him, but it is not too late for us. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like, please subscribe and give a like. And if you want to see me talk more about literature, I'm going to put you some link here. And if you want to talk, see me talk about other topics, for example, linguistics, I have this video about how this, we decipher the Hittite language that has been getting a lot of views lately. And remember, uh, I talk about whatever I find interesting at the moment, so you never know what my next video is going to be about. But I think that's part of the uh, appeal of this channel. Uh, thanks for watching.